Excellent. Welcome, everybody. I'm super, super thrilled to be hosting this webinar um, and bringing Dr. Holly Lucille in to teach us about thyroid dysfunction. I want to give you guys um, a little bit of context before we dive in and before I sort of pass the mic over to Holly to share this wonderful presentation that she's put together. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit of the backstory of how this happened. So earlier this year, I was at a dinner hosted by a good friend of mine, um, uh, Dr. Julian Brighton, who was putting together this great dinner for all these people that were in town for the, I think it was the, um, well, I don't know, some nutrition conference, some health conference. I actually don't even remember what conference it was. But I was sitting next to um, a woman from Fullscript, and we started talking about you know, what she does and what I do. And um, for those of you that don't know about Fullscript, you will learn about Fullscript later. But the core thing is that Fullscript, in addition to being an, a dispensary for health professionals for supplements, also has this massive educational um, arm to their work. And that really lit me up because my goal is education and bringing information and education to the practitioners that I serve. So we immediately got talking about how we can bring more education to this audience. And this is the result of that conversation. And I'm so excited. Um, and my hope is to do many of these going forward and bring this um, education and uh, information that's really applicable in your practices to you. So um, today we have Dr. Holly Lucille, who is a naturopathic doctor and a registered nurse. She is nationally recognized and licensed naturopathic doctor, educator, natural products consultant, and a television and radio host. And she's the author of several book, books, including uh, Creating and Maintaining Balance, A Women's Guide to Safe Natural Hormone Health, and uh, The Healing Power of trauma comfrey, I think that is correct. Um, and she is here to talk about thyroid hormone and in discussing what content we wanted to share with this audience, with you guys, thyroid hormone is so critical. It literally underscores everything. It regulates all of the things. And unfortunately, it's also a prime target for environmental chemicals. And I wanted to bring Dr. Lucille in to kind of lay the foundation of what thyroid dysfunction looks like in our practices and what we as practitioners should be aware of um, in navigating this uh, information. So Dr. Lucille, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your day to yeah. share this information with us. Laura, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited. I <clears throat> I love this topic because, you know, if uh, I think it's on my email signature, I don't know. I have a little tagline that says "Let's think things through," and the way that I came up with that tagline is I literally was in practice. My patients have taught me everything I know. Basically, I mean, medical school kind of gives you a vocabulary to use. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you really start getting into it when you start practicing clinically and um, and so I, I literally I pushed myself my chair back after doing an intake and you know that good clinical acumen you can have. And I said out loud, like, let's think this through. And in my opinion, you know, so many of other systems of medicine, perhaps conventional medicine, have I feel like they've stopped thinking. You know, if we can tie into uh, especially with the endocrine system, you know, I've said before, I don't think medicine has to be rocket science. There are so many things in my practice that I can help folks do using the least invasive methods. So dietary interventions, lifestyle, certainly avoiding um, this incredibly increasingly toxic environment and the um, toxins that are, are, are in it for sure. And it's amazing how people's lives can actually be turned around. But when we talk about the endocrine system, especially with the thyroid, I think the devil is in the details. So even though this is going to be more high level, I really, really, really like to think it through. Yes, love it, love it. Yes, that's why I brought you here. All right, so let's are we it. ready to roll? Yeah, let's do it. All right, and anytime. So I want to I want to let everybody know I do believe this is going to be uh, recorded, and then also the recording will be sent out to you, so you don't have to worry about you know frantically writing down everything I say. You can listen uh, again and again. I do that a lot when I have calls with um, folks. I'll just put my voice message on. And I'll try to kind of sit back, take it in. And then, um, you know, listen to it over and over again. It's very helpful. I think you also get a handout too. So sit back, relax. And Laura, anytime you want to pop in and uh, jump on something I'm saying or gosh, 
for for sure. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Please do so. Okay. Yes, I absolutely will. I <laughs> doubt I will have to correct you on anything. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. So I, I view myself as a very comprehensive empirical uh, practitioner, and but I I do have a huge respect for the research. And you know, lately I've been really defining myself much much more as a clinician than than as a scientist. Um, and, but in this case, the research, I have to say, is all over the place. When we're talking about thyroid dysfunction, and we're talking, gonna, we're mostly gonna be talking today about hypo functioning of the thyroid, okay? Um, I certainly see wildly different theories regarding thyroid disease and treatment biting for our and our patient's attention. Um, I see a lot of prescribing too, of thyroid uh, replacement therapy, I would say. And as well, I, I, I I want to look at a woman coming into my office. Let's say she presents, 32-year-old woman uh, with underfunctioning thyroid. She has it because her TSH is elevated, and we'll get into all those lab tests. Um, but instead of just go, okay, let's get that TSH back within normal limits and give you some thyroid replacement therapy, um, usually what I'm seeing is in super physiological doses, I want to scratch my head, think it through, and say, um, how can we understand why the thyroid is underfunctioning, and then help restore function first, not just simply look at replacement because, hey, is it an autoimmune reaction? We know that that's the number one cause of hypothyroidism. Is the gland itself not producing enough thyroid? Are we not peripherally converting it? Um, is there too much binding globulin? Is it not absorbing into the cell? Is it not transporting into it? Is there receptor site? Is it is it is that not responsive? Do we not have enough receptor sites? And I uh, and I could go on and on, and I will. All right. So next slide, please. So this is um, simply a quote that I love: "Keep an open mind, but don't let your brain fall out." So my hope for our time together is that we anchor in more comprehensive, you know thoughts about this and really drill down and think and treat with critical thought processes that are modern day demands so we can really elevate our patient care, especially when it comes to thyroid. So quickly, our objectives. Next slide, please. Um, so we want to think through the reasons for the dysfunction of the physiological processes leading to the metabolic effects. So metabolic effects, usually we see hypometabolism. Okay, discuss the appropriate treatment options for the variety of the causes of hypothyroidism. So not just here, take this. We're going to really think this through. And then focus on treating the clinical story, not lab test, because a lot of times this is not a numbers game anymore. Okay, and we want to restore the normal function of the thyroid gland, not replace it if we don't have to. Um, a lot of times I'll use the analogy of um, a fire alarm okay when it comes to the thyroid oh, it's the wrong analogy sorry um we'll, we'll get into that later anyways next slide okay so we're going to talk about the problem and there is a bona fide modern day hypo functioning thyroid problem uh we'll talk about if, an, if the thyroid dysfunction is under treated the consequences we'll re review the thyroid basic which is always really important because I, I, like I said, endocrinology, you got to keep going back, understanding these feedback loops, understanding what controls what, all the, the, the contributing factors, really, really important. Um, then we are going to go into, sorry, you're at, or I'm seeing, Cam, can you go back to not the problem? Just can you go back to, there you go. That's where we're at. Um, okay. So the, we're going to talk about clinical manifestations, both the signs and symptoms, developing a diagnosis, uh, possible causes and contributing factors, because identify and treat the cause is big, uh, the solutions that match that, and then go into a case study, okay? And I think part of the solution is just to be stimulated to ask better questions. You know, linking the review of thyroid physiology along with developing a diagnosis and possible causes and contributing factors is really the linchpin and the clinical sweet spot for me in this lecture. All right, so let's move on now to the problem. So here it is, as many as 27 million Americans may have some type of thyroid disorder. Of that number, half remain undiagnosed, okay? And this certainly is my experience clinically every day. I see people coming in with protracted fatigue, constipation, hair thinning, stubborn weight gain, 
depression. And in, it's alarming and I think, frankly, unacceptable, the number of folks that are not properly cared for and paid attention to that come in lab test in hand, okay? Meaning, yeah, their T TSH is 4.2, they're quote unquote fine. And meanwhile, their health and their quality of life is suffering. Um, and you know, I've heard this phenomenon called subclinical hypothyroidism, right? Which I honestly think is being used wrongly. And I've also heard sub-laboratory, but that's one of the biggest controversies out there right now in the whole story, the lab tests, which tests, what range, what diagnosis. So Broda Barnes, um, he's an MD who wrote Hypothyroidism, the Unexpected Illness, noted that many patients with clinical symptoms of hypothyroidism remain undiagnosed and untreated based on conventional thyroid function tests. All right, so let's go into the next slide. And I just, I'll add in sure. that because this audience is mostly women, this ties right into this issue where women's concerns are being dismissed in conventional medicine practices where they're like, oh, you're just tired. Oh, you know, you're a mom or, oh, you're getting older. Um, I don't know, um, Holly, if you saw the recent article, I think it was in The Guardian about the bias in research and testing um, against women in all of the history of medicine. I thought it was quite infuriating, but it just ties into that like normal is it common, not normal, right? So we have all these symptoms that are common, but they're not normal, but they're so common that they're just getting dismissed as sure. being normal. And I think yeah, that's a big yeah, it. And problem. Yeah, it, and, and we, all the things that you said and or you might have a deficiency in an SSRI, so we should just give you that because that's really your big deal and that's what's gonna yeah, fix you, totally. right? Yeah. Yeah, no, this is, that's a really, really good point um, because, uh, once again, this is not a numbers game. This is not a laboratory diagnosis. This we have to focus on clinical symptoms. And it's really important because hypometabolism can affect everything. In fact, let's just go on here. So Broda Barnes, he was also among the first to report associations between hypothyroidism and other things such as chronic fatigue, migraines, emotional issues, infections, I would say menstrual disorders, cardiovascular disease, arthritis, diabetes, lung disease, obesity, blah, blah, blah. We could go on and on and on. So if not diagnosed and treated thoroughly, I think hypothyroidism can in some cases become severely debilitating or even fatal. And once again, if we just got docs out there looking at that TSH, which in my opinion would be great to pick up a pituitary tumor, not so much anything about thyroid function, um, we've got a lot of patients that are being undertreated, okay? Right. And, I, and I'll and i slide in here one more time, and I'm, I'm hun mm -hmm. my hunch that we're not going to get to this in this particular webinar, but the importance of appropriate thyroid levels in the pregnancy audience, preconception and pregnancy audience, because that also is going under addressed and has massive implications in terms of developmental um, health in children, IQ levels, which in turn have massive economic impacts. Like there's the thyroid is like so critical in that window. Um, and not everybody as a practitioner is necessarily working with that audience, but I just wanted to put that out there that is unbelievably critical for normal fetal development. You know, Laura, it's a great point, and I would have to even add to that, then after after conception, after carrying the baby after birth, that thyroid function in so many postpartum women does not, it's like a flip that was switched, right. and it's not switched back on. Yeah. And it, it, I see it so much because I think in our society, we do not honor what the woman goes through as far as... Um, you know, incubating this this zygote into a fetus, into having the baby, and then caring for a very dependent soul, um, and the the mom after the pregnancy and after the baby can suffer so much from an underfunctioning thyroid as well. So it's a great point. All right, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so thyroid basics. So, you know, let's just the thyroid hormone regulates metabolism in every single cell in the body. Okay, it. At the end of the day, T3, okay, and we're going to go through all of it, how it's converted and such. 
it hooks on to the receptor site in every single cell in the body and is responsible for aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. And the thyroid actually gets its um, is named from the Greek word called thyreos, because I think it actually does shield us. So let's not think of this quite honestly as a pathology, because I think that sometimes what we might be trying to do clinically is driving us to pinpoint this diagnosis of pathology, right? Perhaps if it, you know, it could be the system under functioning or, or rather appropriately functioning on our behalf in a compensatory and protective manner. It's its job, right? To be sensitive to changes in the body chemistry and make shifts accordingly. I mean, if we're cold, it steps on the gas and creates heat. If we have an infection, revs up the immune system. If we are stressed with 16 hour days and coffee and Krispy Kreme, it's gonna slam on the brakes. So, but if, if, if these shifts, all right, that the, the, the thyroid is so sensitive to become chronic, that's when the thyroid fatigues and falters, all right? So it's kind of like the check engine light in your car, right? You can, the check engine light comes on and you can go, oh, hey, let's just replace the bulb because the check engine light is on, or we can pull over, look underneath the hood, think about what this whole car has been through, and, uh, and really get to the real issue. But the thyroid is the check engine light, in my opinion, of the body. So once again, at the end of the day, both aerobic and anaerobic metabolism in every cell in the body. All right, next slide. So here we are. Let me just go through this. Um, I'm gonna go slowly through this, okay? Uh, like I said, the devil is in the details. This is very critical. So what happens is you've got thyroid releasing hormone, right? From the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. This is gonna be just all of this kind of basic thyroid function, very complex, okay? It's one of the hardest of hormones to understand. So from the anterior pituitary, this is where thyroid stimulating hormone TSH synthesis is released, uh, um, the TSH synthesis and release are stimulated in the anterior pituitary, all right? So in response to then TSH, there's a large glycoprotein, thyroglobulin, is synthesized. And T4, so we, we know T as tyrosine and four is four iodine molecules, and to a very limited extent, T3, are produced when tyrosine res res residues are iodinated and coupled together under the action of thyroid peroxidase enzymes, okay? So T4, I want to mention that I don't believe that we've ever really understood that there is a receptor site for. So I would call it more of a pro-hormone than I would a hormone, all right? But T4 is then peripherally transformed into T3 and reverse T3. We're going to talk about reverse T3. Because without talking about reverse T3 with this conversion, it'd be like driving your car. I have a lot of car analogies apparently in this lecture. It'd be like driving your car without a brake. Okay, reverse T3 is there for a reason. And this conversion happens, I would say primarily in the liver, about 60%, some in the heart, muscle, and nerve tissues, and then a big one, 20% in the intestines. Okay, so the activity of five prime deiodinase and five deiodinase enzymes, this is where this happens, this uh, peripheral conversion T4 to T3. And then, of course, we got to get this T3 absorbed by the cell and transported and attached to the nucleus where the receptor site is. Okay. And then there is, of course, that negative feedback mechanism through the hypothalamus and the pituitary that controls the production. So if the cells in the body are like, oh my gosh, I need a little more gas in my tank, they're gonna be talking to the brain. And that's how hopefully that is going to happen. So let's go to the next slide. So this image I came up with because in my opinion, identify and treat the cause of thyroid dysfunction. Thyroid, it, it feels like a big relay race, right? So the hypothalamus and pituitary function, I would say that's leg number one, all right? Because we have to ask ourselves, where are, along the track did we drop the baton? Then I would say the action at the thyroid gland itself, which is, is actually the gland that makes the hormones, that's leg two. Then you have the peripheral conversion, that's leg three. And finally, the absorption and contact with the receptor site, that's leg four. So 
so much in our modern day can affect this process. I mean, like I said, um, we've got so many opportunities to drop the baton. We've got to have healthy flora for the peripheral conversion to happen. The nutritional status of a patient is crucial because the thyroid function is so nutrient dependent. We've got um, things like P5P, B2, B3, magnesium, selenium, zinc, copper. These are cofactors in which TPO can actually liberate uh, iodine. So you've got to also have iodine available. Essential fatty acids as well as vitamin D are important for proper receptor site function. So, so much can go wrong, but we have so many things in our toolbox to help it go and stay right, okay? As long as we're looking at this completely and comprehensively. So we're gonna keep this, um, where did we drop the baton in mind? So let's go to the next slide. So let's just talk about some of the clinical manifestations and I could probably have seven slides on this. Next slide as well. So symptoms of thyroid dysfunction. Um, if you think about this, we're thinking about symptoms that are consistent with lower rates of metabolism. All right, so fatigue, weakness, uh, constipation, weight gain, sluggishness, cold extremities, intolerance to cold, hoarse voice, muscle aches, headaches, decreased libido, depression, poor concentration, memory loss, painful joints. I would say poor digestion is in there too. So it's important to note, and this is, I think, the take home from this slide is these are very nonspecific, right? And they overlap considerably. And I think get clinically confused with other diagnoses like food allergies, hypoadrenalism, iron deficiency, maybe a candida complex or so, uh, modern day hormonal transitions or hormonal imbalance in general. Um, and some patients don't volunteer these and perhaps are not even aware of them. So this is where that good clinical acumen and careful questioning is certainly needed. Um, Okay, and then next slide, so signs of thyroid dysfunction. So the thyroid actually underwrites transcription and assembly of our glycosaminoglycans. These are water magnets and our, our building blocks for our collagen. So without it, we can't retain water. So clinically, this manifests as that dry, wrinkled skin, lusterless hair, brittle nails, painful joints. Um, Inability to hold water inside the cell also results in fluids leakage into extracellular space. And so this sometimes you see that rounded face or you can get leg edema. Like another good thing to look at is a swollen or scalloped tongue. Um, thyroid hormone also assists in insulin, moving glucose from the blood into the cells. And so when thyroid levels are low, more insulin is actually needed. And you get more insulin, you've got more fat cell hyperplasia, which shows up as increased fat de deposition, especially around the hips, the thighs, and the abdomen. Okay, so somebody could say, oh man, that's just menopause. You're just in menopause. Um, but no, that's that truncal obesity. The conversion of beta carotene into vitamin A is dependent on thyroid hormone. So you can see that follicular hyperkeratosis on the back of folks' arms. So um, there's, you know, we can get delayed Achilles reflex, low basal body temperature, alteration, of course, in laboratory values. But in my experience, deficiencies do not show up in blood work until the patient is clinically in dire straits. So on that note, um, let's talk about the labs and de developing the diagnosis. So next slide. So going into developing a diagnosis um, and then next slide, we'll go into the thyroid markers. Okay, so I know this is sort of a rhetorical question, but I would say, why do we run labs in the first place, okay? To diagnose? No, we run them to verify a diagnosis we see clinically. But I see study after study, clinician after clinician, after clinician, basing a diagnosis on lab tests. But much more, you know, this is much more than a laboratory phenomenon. Um, I always make a diagnosis in my clinical hypothesis based on the patient's symptoms and signs, not levels. So I am not particularly a fan of panels, okay? So this you see up here, um, the, in, in a thyroid panel that you can just check off and wanna, you know, lab or quest or such, the resin T3 uptake is outdated about 40 years. Um, it, it, it was used uh, before we could actually measure T3 directly, and it's an estimation based on normal values. Um, so it's, it's sort of like a com computer printout. Um, the FTI as well uh, is calculated based on another estimate. It's cheap because we're not measuring anything. It's somewhat inaccurate, I would say. And T3 uh, used to be fairly uh, expensive to run. I don't believe that it is anymore. 
Um, TSH, frequently the only test performed by conventional doctors. It fails to consider a myriad of factors. Um, and honestly, when you look at the literature, T3 was meant to be a screening tool, not to regulate treatment, all right? So uh, I know that a lot of people run TSH just to CYA, um, and we can talk more about that. It's great for detecting, like I said, a pituitary tumor. I don't pay much attention to it. Um, optimally, I'd like to see it under two, but it can't be the only thing that I rely on. It's also very unpredictable with age, uh, infection, stress, uh, calorie restriction, which a lot of folks are doing these days with the intermittent fasting and such, and also inflammation. So antibodies, autoantibodies, um, thyroid binding globulin antibodies, thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Uh, autoimmune disease is the number one cause, um, and so why should we not be running antibodies in every single patient? And I've had this conversation with one of the most esteemed endocrinologists here in Beverly Hills, and they said to me, and it was, you know, it was a good conversation. We weren't uh, uh, um, contentious at in any point. Um, he said, because we would not do anything different with our treatment, okay? Period. If they if the antibodies are high and you have Hashimoto's, we've, we still have to get the TSH with the normal range. You're going to be on thyroid replacement therapy, and that's it. And we know that if there is an autoimmune issue, we have to stop the auto, autoimmune issue where we find it. We're going to talk more about that. Um, so initial testing for what I do, I'll say is uh, I do a total T4, a free T4, a free T3, a TPO antibody, TSH, because a TPO antibody can really kind of catch it 90% of the time. Um, and also I do vitamin D and ferritin as well because it's required for transport of T3 to the nucleus and cell and util utilization of that hormone as well. So ferritin needs to be not just within that crazy long range. I'd like to see it between 990 and 110. And vitamin D, of course, I like to see between 60 and 80. Um, so I think that these can be used as a piece of the puzzle. Um, normal versus optimal, of course, if you want to just look at it, you can cut off 20% of the range from each side. Uh, well, we cannot treat lab tests in this uh, particular incident. We have to treat people, well, I would say in most incidents. So, all right, so next slide. So listen, hy hypothyroidism is not a laboratory phenomenon. And I think that problem can ensue if this is how we are looking at it. And I see so many people doing this. So in the, the two thousand, you know, first of all, if you go into the endocrinology journals, the, the laboratory tests for thyroid are grossly outdated by decades, all right? Um, the, in, in 2003, the recommendation by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists was that the upper limit of normal for TSH should be changed from 5.0 to 3.04. If nothing else, this raises further questions about the validity of the TSH test. That, and that was a quote by uh, Dr. Alan Gaby. Um, this change alone would quadruple the number of hypothyroid diagnoses and maybe people would get more care. But I think that we have to be able to get outside the box or in this case, outside the range and get into better conversations and look at this just so much more comprehensively. Um, there's a uh, next slide. There's a couple of functional assessments that I still always use before there was blood measurements. This was very common. The basal body temperature, um, really important. Uh, Achilles reflex return. Let me tell you something. If you do Achilles reflex return on every single person in your practice, I would say just do it for your practice because once you see a delayed Achilles reflex return, it is very pronounced. Um, a normal a normal return, if you could see me, I'd go boop, 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 boop. If you hit that Achilles reflex, it goes boop, and then it comes back almost like a slow door closing. It, it The first time you see it, it's pretty amazing. Um, so just know that there are other functional assessments, cheap, easy, you can do just to kind of round out that picture. So let's, next slide, talk about the potential causes. And then next slide, okay. Here's my point, autoimmune destruction. Are we on the same page? Yes, all right. So if you are gonna fix a patient's thyroid symptoms, you have to identify where the problems are in the individual. Like in a sense, where have we dropped that baton? So it's the number one cause of thyroid disorder. It's always, I always screen for thyroid antibodies when symptoms are present. And believe it or not, you if you if you catch it early, and I've seen this in historical labs from patients, you're gonna be able to maybe see a Graves or so diagnosis because we have four months of T4 
stored in our thyroid. So if you've got an autoimmune attack that's attacking the tissue of the thyroid, and remember, that's where thyroid hormone or the pro-hormone of T4 is made, it can be released, converted into T3, and you kind of have this Graves situation. And then subsequent attacks, you're going to have um, decrease in hormone production or pro-hormone production, decrease in that peripheral conversion, and then you're going to see that patient uh, in a grave condition, which would be more of a Hashimoto's, okay? So, but the point for us is if this is going on, number one cause of thyroid disorders, we gotta stop the reaction when and wherever it is we find it. So of course you have to remove the antigens that are provoking the immune attack. You've gotta get your sleuth head on. You know, usually this happens in the gut. By the time it is attacking the thyroid, the gut is inflamed, there's intestinal dysbiosis, there's absorption of larger proteins. And sure, you can get that TSH within quote unquote normal limits, but if you have uh, autoimmune destruction, that those symptoms are going to continue on and so will the autoimmune disease. And to be honest with you, even though we do not have a test to test auto antibodies of our ovaries, I've seen way too many women with un undertreated or undiagnosed Hashimoto's that that autoimmune condition moves on, attacks the ovaries, and by 37 they're in menopause already. And that is something that I think is unacceptable. So autoimmune condition, not just TSH within normal limits, we gotta go deeper into that autoimmune reaction and stop it wherever we find it. Okay, so that's a potential uh, cause of hypothyroidism. Let's go to the next slide, overt. So this lack of production at the gland, right? So the total T4 is the best measurement here. So this of course decreases with age, yes, but if you have a 29 year old with a symptom of low uh, total T4, um, it's not about how much or what kind, but it's why, right? So it's not about giving them thyroid. It's like, because you can have this from chronic stressors, which fatigue the pituitary. This often happens during pregnancy. Um, you've got a normal reaction when a person is under chronic stress is to shut down the thyroid function because the thyroid in the body is meant to take care of us, right? So it's like, um, hey, if you go at this pace anymore, you're gonna crash and burn, so let's slow things down. The thyroid is working on the body's behalf. So what I tend to do with overt thyroid um, dysfunction is look for stressors four to 16 months prior to the symptoms began, okay? So yeah, lifestyle, pregnancy, acute stressors can result in thyroid shutting down and subsequently not bouncing back. Um, also, the thyroid replacement therapy can decrease what endogenous production, all right? Especially the super physiological doses I see given here. Um, lack of iodine or tyrosine is also gonna stop this production of the gland. Um, poor nutrition. And then heavy metals. Okay, what binds up, what does mercury bind up? Selenium. And selenium, the, the, the thyroid function is so selenium dependent, right? That five prime diadenase, so selenium dependent. Cadmium, for that matter as well, will bind up selenium. All right, so we've got to keep looking at um, all of those different things. So that's another one. We've got autoimmune disease. We've got overt function. So let's go to the next side. Then there's functional. This is when the production is actually fine, but there's inadequate metabolism, okay? So something is wrong with the circuitry. So two big things to consider here, I would say, is excessive binding and then poor conversion. So first, excessive binding. A small difference in thyroid binding globulin can have a major effect on the percentage of available hormone. Of course, that's when you bind up the hormone and it's not free to tap into those receptor sites and give the message of metabolism. So most commonly, where do I see this? Estrogen dominance and or estrogen therapy or chronic use of the birth control pill, okay? Um, I have a really kind of joke here that I tell. It's like, so, Oral contraceptives are notorious for increasing binding globulin. So you bind up thyroid, all right? And you also increase sex hormone binding globulin, which preferentially binds up what? Testosterone. So you bind up thyroid so you have no energy. You bind up testosterone so you have no libido. That's probably gonna result in pretty darn good birth control, okay? Um, but something to look out for for sure. Uh, Lara, Lara had mentioned her friend Jolene Brighton. She wrote a great book called Beyond the Pill. 
um, something to think about. So also, what effect binding chronic sleep disturbances? How many folks see people with chronic sleep disturbances in our modern day, okay? So yes, and the other thing is thyroid replacement therapy. One of three things can happen, or sometimes all three, when you are on thyroid replacement hormone. Okay, you have decrease in endogenous production, you increase binding globulin because the brain is gonna like go, okay, hey, that's too much, or you decrease the receptiveness or the number of receptor sites, okay? So the, too much of any kind of hormone, the brain's gonna protect itself. And like I said, I see this all the time. Look, T4 in our prime, what we make is 120 micrograms. The average dose of Synthroid is 100 micrograms. So you're, you're basically telling the person, um, even if you start them out at 50 micrograms, that their thyroid is 50% shot. So I like to start low and go slow. Um, really, really important. Uh, also, um, before increasing the dosage, when they come back, we want to make sure because thyroid binding globulins take time, about two to three months to go up. So you can't retest that patient until they are on that dose for about 90 days, I like to see, as far as um, dosing is concerned. So uh, one of the things that I like to do to maybe understand, and I can't show you this graphic, but you can think of it, is um, so this is functional hypothyroidism, inadequate metabolism, right? I like to plot the total T4, and then I also like to plot the free T4. So even though they're different ranges, and that's the, one of the ways that you can see if there is um, excess binding going on, all right? So excess binding and poor conversion. So we're gonna move on to poor conversion. Next slide. So, hang on here. Okay, decreased conversion. Sometimes I can <laughs> just look at this list and I'm sitting with my patient in front of me and I'm like, mm-hmm, nutrient deficiency, yep. Stress, uh-huh, mercury, uh, lead, alcohol, pesticides, cigarette smoke, medications, um, human growth hormone deficiencies. Once again, this is the um, functional hypothyroidism. This would be the decreased conversion, all right? So my sister, bless her heart, she lives in the Midwest. She can't get proper care there. She is on thyroid, she, her, her TSH, and I know I keep saying, okay, we shouldn't probably look at that, but it goes up and up, but I also see her clinically. She's clinically obese. Um, she, uh, but I, I go through this functional. She has a hard time sleeping. She definitely the work hard, play hard, like we do in the Midwest. And so I'm able to get her T4 with a little bit of T3 because the doctors only have her own Synthroid. I know if she's just on that T4, she's going to have a hard time converging, converting, and that that she's not going to feel well. So. Um, there's that. Okay, let's go through the next one. Next slide, thyroid hormone resistance. Okay, so this is where thyroid levels are actually adequate uh, in values in relationship to others, but the symptoms are still persisting. So you've got adequate production, you've got adequate metabolism, but the thyroid receptors are not responding to optimal thyroid levels, okay? And so you've got a, a decreased responsiveness to the thyroid hormone. What is the number one thing that affects this? It's low vitamin D levels, okay? Um, I think it was Jeff Bland that I, I first heard say that, that it's, it, it, and it affects the thyroid receptor responsiveness. Once again, this is kind of like, it's like insulin resistance, but it's with thyroid. It's not, um, it has nothing to do with not having enough thyroid. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with not having enough insulin. It's that the receptor sites are kind of like, eh, I don't think so. So here's the other thing, low ferritin, as I mentioned, candida infections, oxidative damage, period. It's wrecking up our mitochondria. It's also doing a heck of a job on our thyroid receptors. Chronic low cortisol, and of course that would be subsequent to elevated cortisol over a long period of time. And then competitive binding. We can find competitive binding from, um, I would say, environmental toxins or metabolites or products from disrupted intestinal flora creating oxidative damage. All of that stuff functionally we need to be thinking through. All right, so next slide. Give a man a fish and he can eat for a day, but teach a man how to fish and he'll be dead of heavy metal poisoning inside. <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing and sad, but true. I know, I know, because we all love that, you know, 
don't give a man a fish, teach him how to fish. But uh, this is the throat quote that we got from Charles Haas uh, that I like to stick in there. All right, so next slide. Um, so contributing factors, of course. So this is why we're here mostly Let's talk about these environmental toxins. I mean, we are the first generation exposed to such a chemically dependent society. You all know this. Toxins from the environment, such as pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, PCBs, dioxins, heavy metals, they are known to disrupt this delicate balance of thyroid hormone. And I think it's very important. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's not just like, I just had an apple from my grandma's and she doesn't eat you know, she doesn't eat organic. It is the overall accumulation that I'm seeing it. There's a good book, I'm sure Laura has read it called Our Stolen Future about the endocrine disruptors. And it's really this bioaccumulation in our tissues over the years that creates this hormone disruption and imbalance. Um, you've got bed, uh, bread dough that used to contain potassium iodate as dough conditioning. And then in the 70s, it was replaced by bromine. So there, it's an endocrine disruptor. It's part of the halide family, along with, uh, uh, um, it's dangerous because it, it competes for what? That same receptor site, iodine. Yeah. So iodine deficiency, uh, I see it more and more all the time. Increases your risk for cancer, for breast, thyroid, ovarian, prostate cancers. And we are seeing this in alarming rates uh, with that competition. Okay. So, and I think this is where the shield comes in. Perhaps... Yep. This is the shield of the thyroid slowing our metabolism in case um, there is this bioaccumulation of toxins and it's actually protecting the body from harm. So the downregulation of the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid is actually a protective mechanism to conserve energy in this time of stress because your body's trying to deal with all this. So I think it's reasonable to consider if your phase two of the liver can't keep up with detoxifying such a load, the metabolites build upstream. So the slowing of this process might be protective to reduce the rate of buildup, okay? So once again, we can't just go, oh, high TSH, oh, hypothyroidism, uh, let's give them thyroid replacement therapy. Because you could be missing a full-on body burden of all of these environmental toxins. And I think it's, it's worth adding that we can be exposed to everything on this list in a single day, multiple times yeah. a day. And yeah. And, you know, and I, I'd love for you to weigh in on this because I know that this has been discussed by other um, uh, people in the sort of functional and integrative space, in particular, the conversation around seafood that's high in mercury that also happens to be high in selenium. And some people are giving those types of high mercury, high selenium seafood a pass ah. and saying they're okay, which to me makes my toes curl because we need selenium for other functions than just to mop up mercury. Right. Is yes. my take on that. So yes, no, it's a perfect, I, I think it's a perfect point at that point in time. Yes. Um, 100%. Oh my gosh. Selenium. It's like, Oh, and we're so deficient anyway, because the soil is so depleted of selenium. Right. And let me ask you this. I was just reading a book, a new, it's not a new book. It's published about two years ago. Tell, called Toxic Cocktail by Barbara Demaru, I think is how you say her name. Um, and she opens her book writing um, heavily about, it's primarily about thyroid and, and brain function, but um, uh, she's writing about uh, iodine deficiency and that, you know, this push towards people eating sea salt because it's high in minerals, sea salt has zero iodine. Um, and now that people are moving away from eating iodized salt, table salt, and it's not being used in processed foods as much, what's your take on dietary consumption of iodine to help protect against some of these um, other toxins that are gonna be binding, might be binding or, or blocking that binding? Yeah, no, I think I, I make that point all the time. They've got all these different salts um, and culinary salts that people are in, and then we're stopping eating the iodized sea salt. And I. I have seen iodine deficiency on the rise. And once again, to your point as well, it's it, iodine, having a good load of iodine in your body is the number one, the number one prevention for mental retardation. Yes. Um, and iodine is so important. And I don't think that people get a lot of iodine naturally from their diets. No, no, because where you know, the other sources that are high is shellfish and nobody wants to eat shellfish anymore because they all have microplastics in them. So, you know. <laughs> 
It, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, but these are the good points, and I think in any crisis, which we could shake our head, we got to find opportunities, and so we can, yeah. you know, adequately supplement cleanly. We know this is going on, and we just have to be defensive about the entire thing. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so. Let, all right, we're on dietary compounds. You know, I just throw this in. Look, look, gluten, 100% number one. Um, some of these things, these are just for information. You know, when I'm trying to figure out what is the cause of hypothyroidism, I, I like to rule out all contributing factors, and I certainly don't want to scare anyone from eating millet or, you know, I'm just kind of making a point. Um, I, I'll have to say there's a journal of pediatrics article reported that gluten-dependent diabetes and thyroid-related autoantibodies found in a patient with celiac disease were completely abolished after simply this kid following a gluten-free diet for, uh, it was for four months. So um, gluten does need to come out in any of these cases. I just found that so clinically helpful. Um, the isocyanothates, I just practicing safe soy is really important. Um, it's not really to avoid these foods because they have been shown to to help detoxify or, you know, it's just not too many in their raw state, I would say, you know, as far as um, uh, the iso, uh, the isothiocyanates as, and then also the isoflavones in soy, it's just being mindful. I mean, if somebody has a high soy diet, I, I do recommend just supplement for proper support. It's really important there. Um, and then, those are just, like I said, I don't want to spend too much time here, so we'll go on. Medications is another thing that you want to look at. Um, you know, the more and more I'm linking chronic prescription drug use to presenting chief complaints when folks come in, I've made it a priority to understand everything that they're on, especially long-term side effects. Um, estrogen replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy, birth control or oral contraceptive, xenoestrogens, anybody who's suffering from that quote-unquote estrogen dominance. Also here, androgens, lithium, um, you'll, you'll see beta blockers as well. Uh, one of the things that I've seen, Tagamet decreases the action of that 5 prime diagonase, which, which, you know, is helpful for T4 to go to, to T3. Um, so that's important. And then going down to the next slide, stress, uh, it, it just stress induced, uh, hypothyroidism, this access between the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, thyroid, it, it's just, it's so close. Um, the stress shuts down the thyroid. It's just another case where I think the thyroid kicks in or rather kicks out in a compensatory way. Um, you may have to give cortisol to make the thyroid uh, supplementation work properly um, because normal thyroid function requires normal adrenal function. Uh, let's just talk about it this way. Excess cortisol, you're going to inhibit the T4 to T3 conversion, and you're going to increase reverse T3, okay? And reverse T3 is inert. It, it, it provides no oomph to that receptor site at all. It suppresses TSH. It decreases thyroid receptor responsiveness. It promotes an overactive immune system, and it increases the chance of an antithyroid antibody being produced. That's excess, uh, excessive cortisol. Low cortisol decreases thyroid receptor responsiveness, transports across the membrane uh, in energy dependent and modified by cortisol, and it may inhibit T4 to T3 conversion. So it's really important to understand this simultaneously, okay? Um, and, and the other thing, if, if you've got, uh, so catabolism, right? That's the breaking down of things. So let's say somebody is just, in that catabolic state, and they're, they're, the glucocorticoids are just, th the, and the, the cortisol is just up there. But they're also complaining of fatigue. And you're like, you know what? I, I actually heard a doctor the other day, you know what? Oh, there's fatigue, just increases thyroid to four grains. I'm not kidding you. Just, oh, just no, no assessment. So if you're in a catabolic state and you're breaking things down, so your ability to grow and heal versus your ability to um, wear and tear, your wear and tear is up. And you, and you increase metabolism just by giving more thyroid, what do you think is gonna to happen to the body? It's just gonna increase wear and tear. So this stuff has to be thought about. We have that, this, this, this modern day stress that we are all under compounded, confounded, continual stressors and the way that our body is responding to them. And you know what I'm seeing more and more every day in my clinic is people come in and they just seem cool as a cucumber. And now, they've got symptoms that would suggest otherwise, 
but it's almost like we've got this new adaptation happening. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is just the new normal. This is how I live. It's not, it's not even crazy anymore. It just is. So the constitution, I feel like of people are, oh, this is my own, you know, opinion. So don't, don't take this anywhere. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, it's almost like people are just like, yeah, hey, I got this, but it's so much and it's affecting our physiology. Um, so really important to understand here. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so obviously these are all the contributing factors just for a review. Next slide. And let's talk about finally solutions. So let me make sure Cam and I are on the same page. Yes, we're going to talk about core, core concept. These are, I'm a naturopathic doctor. These are principles. You know, they're, they're very familiar to uh, functional medicine doctors, integrative or integrative um, docs. You know, it's like we want to use the leads and basin methods to diagnose and treat. We want to make sure that we're doing root cause medicine. Uh, we've got to pay attention to people, not just lab tests. We have to also teach along the way. So it's not just here, take this. Making sure that this is a big engine in our body and so treating it adequately is prevention for other um, issues and then respecting that the body does have an innate ability to heal and that that thyroid might be under functioning for a darn good reason so i wish there was a protocol i could just show you you know and say hey this is what you do <laughs> but more like i said with endocrinology and with thyroid i call them wake-up calls i think it's difficult um you know and one of the, you know perhaps one of the best things that we can do during a clinical situation is just ask better questions so no matter what the cause i believe the goal is to restore the normal function of thyroid gland and the thyroid pathways first not replace it if you don't have to so if you're going to fix the symptoms of hypothyroidism you have to identify where the problem is for that individual so let's go um, you know, and, and this is something that I, next slide, uh, that I say to my patients all the time, taking a pill is easy. I am the daughter of two pharmacists. I, I grew up here, take this, here, take this, here, take this, you know, and I tell people, you know, lifestyle changes and lasting nutritional support, sometimes dietary interventions, it's not that easy and it's, it's rarely quick. And so, you know, I ask them when we're going through this, you've got to commit for six months. And usually in two months we can get people feeling better, um, but it's it that is this is not a quick quick thing, and, and that's where that dossier doctor is teacher comes in because if you can just prep that and say, look, this has probably been going on for a long time. There's been a couple or a few or many contributing factors. We're gonna unwind this, um, but it's gonna take some time. All right. So next slide. Let's talk about some lifestyle targeted interventions, detoxification and stress and sleep. I'm sure this will be pretty, um, uh, you know, pretty rudimentary and, and, and remedial for most of you, but it's, it's kind of like the whole plan coming together. So diet and lifestyle, uh, look, if you look up diet in the dictionary, it means habitual nourishment. And that's how I like to talk to people about, like how in the habit do you nourish yourself? Uh, low antigen, high anti-inflammatory for sure um, in this condition. I sometimes put people on a serotype or blood type diet, just decreasing their, you know, really quick way of perhaps uh, avoiding maybe some food sensitivities, encouraging organic whole food diet. I think that in this case, even though intermittent fasting is very, very um, uh, hot right now, it's imperative to keep the blood sugar stabilized. Um, and then get that crap out, aspartame, trans fats, really important. Off of gluten for sure, um, 60 days, there was another case report, 23 year old woman diagnosed with hypothyroiditis and an autoimmune Addison's, three months gluten free, massive improvement in symptoms, more importantly, decreased the amount of thyroid and adrenal replacement. After six months, her thyroid medication was actually able to be discontinued. Um, exercise is really important. It stimulates thyroid gland secretions, increases tissue sensitivity to thyroid hormones, absolutely has stress relieving effects and so much more. But think about it just like that uh, insulin resistance. OK, so anything to stop the inflammation, clean up any underlying infections, any hormone imbalances, uh, DHEA deficiencies, which, of course, is an adrenal hormone. So we need to think about that. This can grease the skids for success. So that very comprehensive. Let's look at everything. Uh, next um, slide. So just in general, like I said, everybody is different. Perhaps instead of some um, uh, standalones, maybe 
a good multivitamin is going to be important. Vitamin A and vitamin D, um, both of them have been identified as pro-hormones that help regulate gene expression pathways shared with T3. Um, vitamin D levels, we, we don't want just one click above rickets, uh, anywhere from 60 to 80 is what I've seen, as it's helping T3 bind to those nuclear receptors. Um, but ferritin, I've talked about before, for the transport of T3 into the nucleus. Uh, I, if we need to recover those, usually, usually use a little ferrous glycinate uh, with better absorption than other forms I see clinically, sometimes with a little bit of vitamin C for that absorption as well. Um, our conventional farm soils don't have that selenium, and we can't live a healthy life without it. Deficiency I see is quite common. You can do a serum, uh, serum level of uh, selenium. That 5' prime diagonase will not work without it. So uh, higher doses of selenium has been demonstrated to decrease thyroid antibody levels. So I actually can go up to 800 micrograms. It's helpful in getting those TPO uh, antibodies down. Zinc does this as well, anywhere from 20 to 5 to 50 milligrams of a good chelated zinc. Um, iodine, especially for those with overt, all right? Tons of people, like we have talked about, are deficient in iodine. And uh, I, I do believe that the best, if you want to check that out, a, a, a urine spot test, okay, is really important for that. Um, now, we've talked about, this has come up before about iodine use and autoimmune diseases. Uh, one of the things that I've seen clinically, if I get my antioxidant support up, right, because iodine can spur on uh, part of uh, the, 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 the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, well, what I've been happening is get that antioxidant support up, then I put the iodine on board and it doesn't seem to do. I can still track those enzymes, or excuse me, antibodies, and they're coming down. And that, when we've, when we've got a Hashimoto situation, that's what I'm doing. I'm paying attention to the antibodies. I'm not paying so much attention to the TSH anymore. This is about the autoimmune condition and we want those levels to start coming down. Um, let's see, essential fatty acids are uh, essential for healthy hormone uh, production, including thyroid, so we can't forget about those. Uh, and then there was actually a, a study published in the March issue of the Journal of Brain Behavior and Immunity from the team at Ohio State University stated that stress Overall stress changes the composition, the diversity, and the number of intestinal bacteria. And so I'm at the point in time where I do think that everybody should take a probiotic. And I'm also recommending that folks take those at night um, to be away from any motility, any other supplements, just so they have a chance to set up housekeeping, grow and proliferate, and start to rebalance the gut. So next slide. Um, I think there's benefits in all system medicine. So I use herbal medicine support as well um, for scolin, mimics the effects of uh, thyrotropin. It's a adenylate cyclase activator. Ashwagandha is amazing. Google, and of course there's glandular support, okay? There's freeze dry, they remain intact until extraction, uh, shown to reach peripheral tissues and exert activity. Those are really important. Um, I always, next slide, always, always, always. Yes, we can do testing. And, and Laura, probably you know better than I of the many different functional laboratory tests that are out there where we can uncover solvents, we can uncover exposure. Um, it's amazing to me how many folks are riddled with mycotoxins these days that I'm seeing, but we always take this piece up and it's really important. There's competitive binding, there's the halogen exposure that we're, where we're, you know, the pesticides, the perchlorates, um, it's a environment is a huge issue in thyroid disorders. And the good news is that hydroxylation and phase two methylation, sulfation and glucuronidation, as well as aromatase activity are all diet and supplement responsive. So we can knock these little critters out and we can start the normal function of the thyroid again. Um, and then uh, going down to this slide, listen, there's a, there's a big difference right now, in my opinion, between homo homeostasis, coming back to normal, and allostasis. Allostasis is the brain coordinating a body-wide change constantly in response to something that is chronic, okay? And after a while, this allostatic load 
leads to complications. And I feel this is, you know, yep, yep, we got this, we got this, yep, I got it, I got it, nope, I got financial issues, I got emotional issues, I've got uh, relationship issues, can't find parking, traffic is over the, you know, it's crazy town, but I got it, I got it, I got it. But when we had a more natural relationship with stress, we would have a stressor, we would, yes, fire up all of these enzymes and hormones to deal with the stress, the stress would be mitigated, and then we'd have this nice, lovely, long period of recovery and relaxation. But in my opinion, this recovery is not happening, and we are starting to just knock it into that uh, phase where we're, so we're getting nutrient depleted, and we're getting elevated levels of cortisol that lead to subsequent lower levels of cortisol, and as you well now know, that is affecting our thyroid. So let me quickly go through a case study. We'll go through this because um, I know we're at an hour now. So this is a 38-year-old female. She's a single mom of two girls. Uh, she, this is a patient of mine. She just lost her son in a tragic car accident. She's caring for a father who, has, who was an endocrinologist who has early dementia. Um, she presented with sinusitis. She was tired of being tired and very compliant. She was just over it. Myriad of symptoms including fatigue, hair thinning, constipation, weight gain, she kept saying, I feel like I have hypoglycemia. I feel like I have hypoglycemia. Irregular menstrual cycles, sensitivity to cold, severe elevated stress in the recent past because of um, her, her son dying. And then, of course, nonstop antibiotic use, I noted, just because she had some sinusitis. So her labs that she brought in, and her endocrinologist said that she was normal. TSH was at 3.89. Free T4 was at 2.1. Uh, so next slide. So physical exam revealed delayed Achilles reflex return. Her basal body temperature, which I went home, had her do um, 94.8 to 97.2. She did have slight swelling around her ankles and lower legs and a really pronounced scalp swollen tongue. Um, I did additional testing of her, th her antibodies, adrenal stress index, 4-point salivary cortisol, and environmental pollutants, and I added a vitamin D on there. Um, so... Moving to the next slide. Um, oh wait, did I miss something here? Come, go on back to the uh, that. Don't move to the next slide yet. Um, so, oh you know, yeah, I wanted to report what I found there. So, um, so one of the things about solvents I want to say because this is what I found with her. If, if, if solvent load is adversely affecting um, their brain, they'll typically have like brain fog, right? And, but also balance problems. So for this, I use something called the Romberg test where they stand on the tiptoes with the eyes open and eyes closed. Um, that, you can look it up, it's the Romberg test, R-H-O-M-B-E-R-G. Some people have a solvent burden that is not causing autonomic nervous uh, symptom problems, um, but solvent testing, this, she also uh, had grown up in a, in a dry cleaner that her whole family um, had a, own dry cleaners across the, the the city and so this was just something that I was expect, uh, expecting. Her cortisol was two to three points below normal in each measurement um, so high leading to low so she had a high 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 stress level for a long time leading to a low level of cortisol and her vitamin D was at 40. So next slide here. We definitely did diet and lifestyle interventions, um, complete detoxification protocol to assure that phase one and phase two support Reestablish your healthy gut milieu, kind of like the gut protocol. Synergistic ingredients for adrenal thyroid access, including glandular support. Some essential fatty acids on board, specific thyroid herbal support. Um, so gluten-free and serotype diet, I had her on. Um, multivitamin probiotics, essential fatty acids, 3,000 milligrams a day, 5-HTP ashwagandha, and 500 milligrams, or, or excuse me, 500 milligrams of ashwagandha, and then vitamin D. Uh, was at 5,000 IUs. So after the first month, next slide, she experienced a dramatic improvement of most of her symptoms, especially noted in sleep and fatigue. I have to tell you, she was very compliant and she really wanted to feel better. Um, after her most recent follow-up, this was three months post-presenting, she was able to claim an average of 90% reduction in most symptoms, although cold sensitivity still persisted. Uh, her basal body temperature that we took again reported about 97.4. Um, and then her pulse and blood pressure stayed the same. So uh, next slide, so questions. So yeah, she was just one of those folks. It took some time, three months, but she dug in. We did the lifestyle interventions. We did the, uh, the, the clinical nutrient support. We did the dietary interventions. And of course she was all over the place before. She was grieving heavily, but her adrenal thyroid access was so close and we had to kind of treat both. But she, I'm happy to say to this day, 
uh, is not actually on any thyroid medication, um, and but but she needed thyroid support and she needed adrenal support. And it's just a, an example of what we can do when it's more comprehensive. All right, sorry I went over a little bit there. Obviously, a lot to talk about. We could go on and on and on. But um, any questions? Um, I don't see any questions in the queue. That was amazing. Thank you for doing that deep dive. Yeah. Um, if you do have questions, go ahead and type them in now um, so that we can see if we can get those answered for you. Um, you know, and I just kind of want to circle back around to this discussion of environmental chemicals because obviously that's what you know my audience is tuning in to learn from me on but that this is one of those lifestyle interventions of really like identifying you know what are people eating are they eating high mercury seafood what kind of exposures are they getting do they work in a dry cleaning or work have parents that work in dry cleaners like what are the exposures that they're getting because that is part of the sort of fabric of the story or the sort of tapestry of what's happening for that person. And we have to be able to identify where those people are being exposed. And then in the same way that we would guide people towards taking out gluten and making sure that we're careful with our soy. I like how you said practice safe soy. That's hilarious. <laughs> Um, we also need to be making sure that we are addressing these environmental exposures that are um, compromising thyroid function. All of those halogenated compounds, anything that's chlorinated, brominated, fluorinated, including all of the perfluorinated compounds from nonstick chemicals and firefighting foam that are ending up in our drinking water. So asking people, you know, what, do they live near a military base? You can certainly look up online the um, um, maps, there are maps of um, PFAS contamination, so that's a good idea to be like, hey, does my client or patient live in the heartland of, you know, industry where these industrial chemicals are contaminating the drinking water because that's a significant um, factor that I think a lot of people are overlooking. So um, there are, of course, lots of facets to this thyroid health conversation. Um, and um, I, I just think you, I think everything that you covered um, was a, a really great review of what the issues are, all of the different compounding factors, and then what, what we can start doing as practitioners to not only identify, but address and then it doesn't have to be as complicated. Um, it, it, I, I say that at the same time as going, it's complicated, but it doesn't <laughs> have to be more complicated, but it's complicated. <laughs> um, so I hope that this has been um, informative for everybody that's here. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions because I think you did a great job. Hey, um, uh, I'm, actually, I'm actually able to see some questions here oh, and I've just put them in the, in the okay, chat box there for you. Know. I don't see questions, so you ask them because I don't see them. Sure. <clears throat> so oh, I have one from, oh, you can see them now? Yeah, now I can see them. Okay, I'll let you go ahead. You got a nice okay, voice. Okay, great. <laughs> so, um, great. Okay, I was looking in the wrong place. Um, so Tara asked, what if there is no weight gain issue for a patient, but many of the other um, symptoms are present? How many of the symptoms should a patient have to suspect thyroid dysfunction? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's all over the place. Genetics, epigenetics, all this stuff plays a, a role in how somebody just functions normally. So I wouldn't say, oh, you're not gaining weight. Uh, I, I mean, I have very thin people with low functioning thyroid, but I would just say, think about, think about symptoms of hypometabolism. And I would say one, one symptom has to be present um, for you to understand that that might be something at work and to dig down that, that, uh, rabbit hole just a little bit to excavate there for sure. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then Susan asked about what environmental pollutant test or panel do you use? Um, do you want to answer yeah. that? Yeah, I jump around. You probably know, I mean, Metametrics has a good one. Um, uh, oh gosh, why is it not coming to my right. head? Yes. Yep. Um, yep. yep. Just, oh, gosh. Uh, yes, and and you know keep in mind that all of those tests um, are spot tests. So if you ate something yesterday, it could show up. So keep those in mind. Um, uh, okay. And then Chris asked, um, what did she say about excessive use of birth control? And that's going to crack open a whole door. So yeah, 
Yeah, so yeah. that's just it's, just, it's just estrogen therapies. Um, and estrogen is that, you know, sort of that functional thyroid dysfunction where you're looking at decrease in conversion and also an increase in binding globulin. So um, it's just something that is always suspect. And I don't know, I mean, I know that estrogen dominance really isn't a sort of, it's not presented in the literature, uh, but I see it more clinically we can make, because you know, progesterone has the ability to be usurped into a stress hormone. And so sometimes we, uh, we do, you know, see that sort of imbalance with hormones and it's making a big difference with our thyroid as well. Great. Okay. Um, Rebecca asked, I'm wondering about TPO levels. What is considered too high? There doesn't seem to be a consensus from what I've seen. Well, I think it's a bit elevated and if you can catch Hashimoto's quickly, it's so great to, so I think it's elevated uh, 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 the way that I use it clinically above and beyond the range um that I, i'll run it again I'll, I'll put some things on board um i'll run it again just to make sure it's not climbing because look the last thing you want to do is have this go on and i've got probably now uh, 10 patients that have thyroid prostate antibodies over 900 the the testing the, the testing equipment can't even go further than that um and that is just worst case scenario so if it's elevated at all you want to just suspect for sure Awesome. Okay, let's do one more question. There's a couple other questions, but I want to be respectful of your time because I know you are mm -hmm. a busy lady. Um, do you have, is there any correlation between Epstein-Barr and thyroid? So Epstein-Barr virus and thyroid. Sure. You know, well, first of all, I think the number one, what I've seen lately, cause of Hashimoto's is an Epstein-Barr virus. And mm -hmm. so it is definitely something that I screen for every single patient that has Hashimoto's. But once again, if you're in a conventional world that look at, is looking at the TSH as a gold standard for thyroid function, or if you're like, well, why would I run Epstein-Barr? You can't do anything about it. You can. You increase the resistance of the host, right? So because we're hosting these viruses and you know anything else. And there's appropriate, I think, um, herbal anti-viral uh, things that you can put on board to have the viral load come down and your own immune cells come up. So the fact that there, or the, the idea that you quote unquote can't do anything about it is a, is a conventional reductionistic allopathic idea and it's nothing that we should buy into. Well said, well said. Um, awesome. So let's end on that note. Um, for the other people that asked um, extra uh, questions that we're probably not going to be able to get to, Cameron, do you think we'll be able to um, find a way to get those answers sent out? Sure. Yeah, great. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, um, everybody, for being here, for sticking through this whole um, hour plus presentation. I hope you guys got a ton out of it. Um, thank you, Holly, for yes. um, again taking your time out and sharing this information. And I'm excited to to do it again sometime. Great. I want to thank Full Script for uh, having me, Laura. You as well. Thanks for the work that you do. I'll make sure that I follow you in everything that you're saying because I love it. Oh, thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Full Script. Thank you, Cam. And um, that's it. We'll wrap up for the day. Thank you.